the BP uh, uh, operator here. Uh, sorry. So the BP operator turns into a magnetic flux operator, uh, and this measures the magnetic flux as we discussed. So shortly, I'll uh, 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 basically add perturbations to this Hamiltonian, which would break uh, uh, its exact solvability. I, uh, so a typical perturbation that I would consider. So I can consider various types of perturbations. The simplest that I can consider is just turning on a magnetic field, uh, which has both x and z components, and uh, this is how it couples uh, in terms of uh, the uh, sigma variables. And when I write it in terms of the rows and the mu. Uh, this is the form that it takes. Okay, so so that's where I'll start. But before that, any question from last time? Okay, so let me uh, 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 tell one more thing about these operators. So so as we know that sigma creates two electric charges. And these are the two electric charges that's created, and this is a gauge field that's in between. So suppose I wanted to create one electric charge, okay? So I I want to create an electric charge here. So I flip the mu z, which is plus one uh, for the ground state. I create the uh, electric charge here, and if I operate it on this uh, bond, I also create an electric charge here. Okay? Now, I want to uh, take this electric charge off to infinity, this other one. So, I basically operate with sigma operators here. The uh, first one was here, but that heals this. So, basically, I uh, have mu x i rho z i j mu x j and then this is i j k. So, then I operate it uh, with mu x j rho z j k mu x k. Okay? So, this squares to plus 1 and basically I end up with this. Uh, if I continue doing this, I end up with an operator mu x i attached with a string which starts from goes off to infinity, this cell goes off to infinity. Okay? So, the good thing about this formulation is that as we saw that creating an uh, electric charge was a non-local operator, a non-local operation. Uh, so, it is still a non-local operation in the sense that uh, this is the string part going off to infinity, but I have been able to separate uh, uh, that whole string in terms of the uh, sigma variables into two parts. One this electric charge being created at some site and the rest in terms of the gauge fields. Okay? So, I have been able to uh, write the non-local operator. I have been able to divide the non-local operator in terms of two uh, parts. One is a local operator. Uh, and this is the string part, but uh, writing any of these uh, uh, separately is again meaningless because these are not gauge invariant. Uh, uh, so th remember, this has to be uh, satisfy. This has to satisfy this. All physical operators has to be invariant under this transformation. Independently for all sides. Okay. So, so what used to be a complicated operator, it seems it's still a complicated operator, but uh, it's slightly better in the sense that I've been able to divide it up into two parts. Okay. So, I'll just make one comment and uh, go on. This is also uh, the same kind of thing that we do in the particle vortex duality of superfluids. Uh, we have uh, 
superfluid written in terms of uh, uh, the field theory written in terms of bosons in 2 plus 1 d and then uh, we can do a uh, uh, duality transformation and write it in terms of vortices. Now, vortices are non local objects in terms of bosons they have a, 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 a winding number. Uh, which uh, basically uh, the circulation goes off all the way to infinity and this is a non local object. Okay? So, when we do the dual, uh, duality transformation to the vortex variables, we not only end up with the vortex degrees of freedom, but also a gauge field. Okay? So, 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 basically uh, this is just a side comment. So, I have this vortices, this circulation going around. Okay? So, the vortex is a whole object this circulation going off to uh, infinity this non local object. So, the duality base uh, the fact that we get both the vortex degrees of freedom which are uh, bosons and also the gauge field uh, can be looked up uh, in, in somewhat uh, similar fashion. I denote the score in terms of some boson and then this non local winding in terms of a, a, a gauge field there you want gauge field. So, this is this quite a similar thing that uh, is being done here, okay, but that is just a side comment for people familiar. Okay, so, so that is what I want to do and uh, uh, now uh, you can go back and uh, 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 calculate what Dittiman taught about this uh, mutual semion statistics and you would find that that basically boils down to uh, calculating uh, what these values of uh, the uh, gauge fields are if I have a electric charge at the center and a magnetic charge is moving around or the other way around. Okay? This is an assignment that you can do uh, on your own. After all this is just uh, uh, two uh, uh, I mean uh, spin half system exactly solvable. Uh, all of us can do these uh, calculations. Okay? So, uh, so, what I want to show today is basically a uh, few things which uh, turn out to be uh, more general than this exactly solvable model which survives one, uh, once a break exact solvability and which, uh, which are interesting uh, ways of looking at the problem and much more general uh, uh, features of this uh, problem. Okay? So, uh, so, I will basically add this perturbation uh, uh, and this perturbation uh, uh, in this form uh, in this new variables take this form. Uh, let me explain what these things are. So, this as I explained is something like C dagger i e to the power i a i j c j. Okay? So, this is the z 2 version of the uh, connection. These are the creation and annihilation operators the hopping of electric charges. Okay? So, this term actually induces dynamics to the electric charge okay, which was not present. This induces dynamics to the magnetic flux. Okay? I create a magnetic flux apply this term and it hops from one plaquette to another. So, there was a magnetic flux here I apply rho x on this bond the magnetic flux hops from here to here. Okay? So, those are the action of these two terms. So, you would, it would become clear why this parameterization of uh, this problem in the terms of rows and mu's is slightly uh, superior to uh, the uh, uh, sigmas when you try to put in these uh, perturbing terms. Okay? So, so it is clear uh, what this term is doing. Okay, so, I will take this plus this at the sm at small uh, uh, magnetic field limit and try to tell you something and also large magnetic field limit and uh, try to tell you something. Okay. So, it turns out that even with this you can analyze this in great detail, but uh, the that you can do uh, basically uh, let me first give the references uh, where these things are done in great detail. Uh, so, the first thing is this good R m p 
1970, and there is this Savit RMP 1980, and there is Senkel Fisher PRB 2002, and So uh, there are uh, many more uh, very nice references uh, you can uh, try to. So this is what is known as a Z2 gauge theory with matter field. Uh, it's basically the Z2 version of the electrodynamics, uh, quantum electrodynamics in 2 plus 1 dimension uh, for the yuan uh, fields, which you might be more familiar with. Okay. So okay. So. Uh, so so instead of doing uh, complicated uh, uh, calculations, I'll show you few limits of how the, uh, this thing uh, work out, and uh, it would lead us to important uh, issues of uh, fractionalization of quantum numbers, etc. Okay, uh, but for, before that, uh, I would try to explain uh, an issue related to confinement and deconfinement of electric charges. Okay. So that's basically the plan for today, and hopefully I'll be able to cover this. Good. So first, let me take this Je to infinity, okay, such that Je by Hx, Je by Jm. J e by H z all tends to infinity. So, this is the largest scale of the problem. Okay. So, apart from this term, okay, if I did not have the perturbations, uh, my electric and magnetic field sectors are decoupled in the sense that the zero electric charge sector and the uh, zero magnetic charge sector. Uh, hmm, are uh, the, uh, separated from the uh, uh, two electric charge, two magnetic charge sectors, and so and so forth, and each of them are uh, each of them are uh, eigenstates uh, of the Hamiltonian. Okay. Once I have these terms, this sector starts mixing. In particular, let's look at this term first. So I have the zero electric charge and the two electric charge sectors. They are separated by an energy of the order of Je. Okay? And then when I start, uh, start having this term, it starts mixing these and also had uh, an, uh, electric charge sectors. Okay? But in this uh, limit, when this uh, goes to uh, infinity at the zeroth order, I can neglect this mixing. Okay. At second order, I would have to think about virtual fluctuations and things like that, which would renormalize some of these numbers. But uh, I can do a perturb I can set up a perturbation theory projecting to zero flux, uh, zero electric charge sector. Okay, just like the uh, uh, just like uh, how we get Heisenberg models by projecting to the ground state manifold. Okay, so so. In this limit, this term is essentially inoperative apart from renormalizing uh, coupling constants. Okay? And also, I have satisfied this term by uh, staying in the zero electric charge sector. Okay? So, I will first treat this limit and then I will uh, work out of this uh, part of the phase diagram. Okay? So, I have this term and this term. And this is the uh, uh, limit that I want to investigate. So, H effective is Okay. 
So, so this is uh, what it is, and um, so again, I'll make a comment, uh, uh, and you can go back and uh, uh, basically think about this more. Uh, so, in a case of Maxwell uh, electrodynamics, free Maxwell electrodynamics, the Hamiltonian is something like this. Okay. So, we have a E term and a B term and the squares are basically given by symmetries. So, this is a, max, uh, a magnetic flux term and this as we uh, discussed yesterday is the electric field term. So, it is a very similar kind of Hamiltonian free uh, Hamiltonian and that is, but it is a Z 2 version of the same thing. Okay. So, and this gauge uh, transformations are generated by this operator at every site. Okay. It would flip these degrees of freedom at every site. Okay. So, so Formally, this is the identification, and you can continue. Uh, basically, all the references that I uh, gave uh, makes this identification much more complete and uh, uh, tries to uh, analyze it uh, accordingly, okay? pointing out the differences. Okay. So, I given this, what I want to do is. We, uh, try to understand this as a ratio of these two parameters. So, I have a one dimensional phase diagram as a function of h x by j e j m 0 is infinity and I want to st study what the ground state looks like okay, in this limit. So, let us immediately look at the two limits first and that is what I want to focus on. So, in h equal to 0 limit, we know that we are in the Tori code ground state with no electric charge, uh, it is already set and also no magnetic charge. Okay? So, that is the Tori code limit. Okay? What happens in the other limit? Okay, when this term is very large. So, as you see that when this term is very large, it creates it's uh, so if there were no magnetic charges to start with, it uh, so all these rosettes were plus one. So it starts creating magnetic charges, and if there were magnetic charges it would annihilate them. Okay? So, the number of magnetic charges in a given flux uh, in a given plaquette uh, ke uh, keeps on fluctuating. Okay? Its number is I mean it is not. So, its number is anyway conserved modulo 2, but it fluctuates from 0 1. Okay? This is the case when we say that this magnetic charges are condensed. I will make this statement more clear. Uh, so, this is where I would say that the magnetic charges are condensed and that is the state uh, 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 what it is. So, in terms of these sigma variables, it is much easier to see in this limit. When this term becomes the largest, everything is just the sigma spins are just polarized in the uh, x direction. Okay, so that's the state. So this is uh, roughly the fa uh, phase diagram, and there must be a phase transition in between, which I'd like to uh, understand. Okay, both the phases primarily for this talk, and ideally also this phase transition. Okay, so that's uh, what I want to do. I can do this in terms of these variables, which is what also these. Uh, 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 references do in great generality, but I will use a, a, a trick another mapping uh, a duality mapping uh, to 
discuss these limits much better. Okay. So, any question uh, as to what I am doing? Okay. So, let me draw something. So, let me draw the dual lattice which is obtained by joining the centers of the plaquettes. So, just before I write down things. So, you you can uh, immediately point out that okay, I started out with this operators, multi spin operators. I uh, wrote a uh, uh, set of new variables in which the electric charge uh, term looks very nice, it is just a single operator, but this magnetic flux term is still a complicated thing, it is four operators uh, acting. And uh, why do I distinguish? Okay. Actually, there is no distinction as you know from electromagnetism there is a duality between electric and magnetic fields. So, I could have done the opposite too and this is uh, what I do right now. Okay. The fact that uh, I drew the uh, uh, dual lattice is because the magnetic charge lives on the dual lattice, it lives on the plaquette of the direct lattice. So, I would have to define variables which live on the dual lattice to bring it to nice form. Okay. And then the point is that if I go to this uh, uh, dual variables, if I keep all the terms in the system and uh, start with this and apply this uh, uh, transformation, the electric charge term would become complicated. But in this limit, we do not have that term, we have already satisfied, uh, we are already in the sector where there are no electric charges. Okay. So, this duality transformation would uh, make these uh, terms uh, much simpler. Okay. So, let me write these things down. So, let me introduce a few notations. So, I denote the uh, sides of the direct lattice by uh, lower cases, I would denote these by upper cases, and this is a convention this i j and uh, upper case i j. Uh, would mean that this uppercase i j and uh, lowercase i j just crosses each other like this. Okay, that would be the convention. So, so I want to write these operators. So, I introduce this mu tilde and rho tilde on the sides of the dual lattice and on the links of the dual lattice just like those. Okay. And then this is a identification again I need this gauge field uh, to keep the uh, it gauge invariant things that we discussed last time. And again you would see that I need a uh, constraint because I am over counting. The constraint just this is a dual form of the Cauchy's law here and this is so these are again the magnetic charge density operators on the dual plaquettes on the dual sides sorry and these are the magnetic charge creation and annihilation operators and this is a dual gauge field. Okay. 
bit. So now, is this clear? It's basically I'm doing the same thing, just with this extra twist that things are defined now on the dual lattice. So if this is ij, these are the uppercase ijs. Okay, good. So, so what does this thing look like? Okay. Let's look at this term, which is simple. Just becomes hopping of magnetic charges. So, so it becomes nearest neighbor hopping because it's just uh, this operator on. So it translates into hopping like this. That's this term. What about this term? So let me write it first and then explain. Okay, as I promised. So the way to see that is basically these are I, J. K L. So these are let me call this I J capital K. Capital L. Yeah, my notation is Yeah. So basically, uh, the bonds uh, denote uh, are denoted by this uh, thing. So 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 this part, which is product of this, 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 and this, becomes product of these bonds, the rho x's. Okay. So so it becomes a product of row x's on these bonds. Okay. And this, as we know from this constraint, has uh, dual Gauss's law has to be So that's this term, okay? And as I explained, uh, that this has to be uh, the case because there is an electromagnetic duality. It cannot be that there is only a transformation in which the electric charge term is simple and the magnetic flux term is complicated. There has to be the other transformation too, and that turns out to be the. So in this form, it's much easier to uh, try and uh, understand this phase diagram. So when JM is uh, a large, which is this limit, I just neglect this term, and uh, I have no magnetic charge. Okay, that's the ground state. 
if I put in so the magnetic charge costs an energy of the order of J m okay. When I take this term and yeah, I take this term and try to understand what happens, it creates magnetic charges which pays an energy cost of around this and then it hops uh, the magnetic charges can hop around. When the magnetic charges can hop around this no longer remains flat it acquires a dispersion ok just like electron hopping on a uh, lattice it has some gauge field ok I will come back to what that gauge field is, but that is what happens just gains a dispersion and the width of this dispersion is of the order of h x ok. So, that is what is happening in this limit ok. So, the magnetic charge energy is still finite it is not exactly j m, but it ranges between j m plus minus order h. Is point clear? Okay. Let's look at this other limit. So, I need to now uh, tell you more carefully what this term is ok. So, again the analogy is what this term is doing is basically uh, uh, hopping around uh, the uh, making the uh, magnetic charge ho hop around ok. So, So, basically if uh, this is now the dual uh, 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 placket. So, these are the sides of the dual lattice. So, magnetic charge starts from here it uh, goes to here and basically hops around comes back and annihilates ok. So, what is the phase acquired in this process if it hops in the background of this field. The phases acquired are product of rho tilde z i j ok i j belonging to this dual plaquette. This, but this is nothing but the Hano Bohm flux that is acquired by going around this plaquette ok. So, this is now the direct lattice this dotted one. So, the picture that is dual to this ok. So, this is the site of the direct lattice ok. And if you go through all these uh, calculations properly you would find that this is this phase is nothing but the electric charge density on this site ok. There are various ways to see this I and mean, one is just go through the uh, uh, things that I uh, did. The other thing is that if uh, as Dipti one pointed out that if there is a electric charge sitting and the magnetic charge goes around it gains a minus 1. If there is no electric charge that is uh, there the magnetic charge goes around and just does not gain a phase ok that also comes out of this the new uh, variables that I have defined just write down relations and you would find that this is equal to j z and which is i sitting ok. So, we really do not have any electric charge we have set them uh, to be of infinite energy cost. So, so this is always plus 1 in this sector 
and that means that going around it does not see any flux okay and that's basically a zero flux problem and now it's i can choose this row z differently to make this plus 1 okay i can choose minus 1 minus 1 minus 1 minus 1 and it's still plus 1 i can choose even number of minus ones still I can choose this this is same as a gate choice in uh, uh, maxwell theory okay so let me choose this gauge where everything is plus 1 okay so i can always choose a gauge it's just i mean landau level problem you can choose a landau gauge symmetric gauge you can solve the problem it's just similar thing okay so so in that limit i can actually drop this thing set this all to be plus 1 okay and then I have this problem of I think magnetic charges hopping in a zero flux field. Okay? And if I allow them to hop, this would gain an expectation value. When this is zero, this is just a classical Ising problem, ferromagnetic Ising problem. Okay? And it undergoes uh, ordering all the mu x's become plus 1 or minus 1 okay and that's the ising uh, broken symmetry phase uh, and that's basically uh, what is happening here that's, that's the magnetic charge condensate okay so i have this magnetic charge condensate in this limit Okay, where the mu x is uh, condense. But notice that mu x is are not physical op uh, operators. They are not physical in the sense that uh, you cannot isolate one mu x. Okay? So, there is a slight trick into what I uh, said, but yeah, let me go, not go into that. Uh, it's, uh, so, something very similar to uh, Higgs uh, uh, transition, uh, okay, where I condense some charges actually in the dual language. So, that is what is happening here and when I uh, make this slightly non-zero, this feature survives. If you have studied Bogolibov theory of superfluidity, etcetera, I put in interactions things survive okay so same kind of calculations so this is the magnetic charge condensate phase okay actually i can do more once i set this to 1 actually study the entire phase diagram it's 2 plus 1d ising model right so i know what this phase transition is it's going to be in the 3d ising university class and the transition is from mu x not equal to 0 to mu x equal to 0 okay and in the dual language the uh, wave function here is basically all up in the z basis and x or the opposite thing but again i'd like to emphasize that this does not break any physical symmetry these mu's are not physical operators which carry any uh, global charge okay so, this is 3D Ising and so to just differentiate between the fact that it is not the conventional uh, uh, Ising transition of order parameters, 
uh, uh, I mean uh, nomenclature has been used to uh, call this 3D I think star that is the uh, nomenclature to point out that this is not the Ising transition of order parameters ok. So, that is the phase diagram. Huh? Yeah, so, so when I pu uh, put this to 1 is a transverse sealizing model in 2 plus 1 d. So, 2 plus 1 d is like 3 uh, classicalizing model ok. So, it has 2 phases this and this ok. If it were order parameters right, if it was really an Ising model uh, that I would write down and this would represent physical spins sorry, this would represent physical spins where tilders ah ok sorry yeah. So, so uh, if it was really uh, I would have these would be order parameters like spins uh, it would represent some breaking of global symmetry global z 2 symmetry ok, but these are not order parameters ok. So, in that case that would be a 3 D Ising transition, but the fact that here these variables that look like Ising variables when I choose a gauge, uh, but actually are non local operators in terms of my original spins just to remind ourselves of that I put this asterisk here that is all and that is the nomenclature that people use in this field yeah. yeah. Right, so the, the entanglement entropy is already non trivial here throughout this phase, it would be different uh, at this point and then it would be trivial uh, here ok. So, any question about this part ok, I am doing good. Yeah, but in 1 plus 1 d yeah, yeah. yeah right right yeah. So, then you cannot have these deconfined phases very easily no. I'll, uh, as I will point out yeah sure 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 sure, but, but it would be 2 d Ising ok ok. So, any more question about this ok. So, let me go one step forward and explain some more interesting things. Yeah, yeah right, right, right. These are not physical spins. It's not. So, let me do yeah. say that again is it related to some hidden order I mean like in it's the spin one chain if you call topological order hidden order yes I think uh, uh, like, like, like in the spin one chain that in the Halden phase you have the ordering of the I mean it, it, it means a local order. Yeah, so is it I something similar or I it might be just semantics, but uh, I think this idea of non local uh, order parameter is not very useful. Uh, it might be that some non local operator is non zero on one side and zero on the other side, but uh, trying to characterize this and write down field theories in terms of uh, these uh, are not extremely useful. Uh, that is why I would uh, try to uh, avoid that nomenclature, but I think some of these things you can try and understand 
I don't know if John has any comment on this, uh, but uh, this is what uh, my understanding is. Okay. So, what I'll do next is basically uh, I said that electric charges are extremely expensive in energy, and but what I'll do is that physically I'll take two electric charge and just put them okay in uh, some place okay so locally i would crank up this uh, electric uh, this field okay on two sides uh, on a row and basically end up with a charge two electric charges say here i and say here j Okay, but still in this limit. Okay, okay, just physically put two electric charges. Okay, and try to understand what's happening to these electric charges. Uh, if I uh, try to put two electric charges by hand. Okay. So, so is this clear? So I, I'm still in this limit. I. Just physically put two electric charges by using an external potential. Okay. So, so I have an electric charge here and an electric charge here. Okay. And I want to understand what happens now. So now, as we <laughs> realize that, okay, let me draw this thing once. So, if there is an electric charge here, if a magnetic charge goes around this plaquette, it should feel a pi flux. Okay? So, now I cannot put all the rows in this to be plus 1 and same for this plaquette cannot put all the rows to uh, row tilde is to be plus 1 row tilde sets so let me draw this thing here Okay. Everywhere else, I can uh, put rho z to be plus 1, but not around this plaquette and not around this plaquette. Again, you can choose various ways uh, 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 what the gauge is, and let me choose 1. Okay. So, that is for rho z tilde, and similarly for here. Notice that with this choice, I have ensured that there is no pi flux around this plaquette. You can choose whatever gauge you want. Uh, this calculation will go through. I mean, you would have problems calculating, but if you did the calculation, you would get the same result. Okay. So this is a choice now. That's the choice of rho z. Okay. And notice that rho z doesn't have any dynamics. Okay, in this limit. So now I can, with this, I can start doing my calculations. Okay. So I can try to calculate what is the energy change. Okay, what is the change of ground state energy in this limit? Okay, putting two electric charges and recalculating the energy, ground state energy. Okay. So let's try to do it here. So this is where I won't be able to uh, go away from this point and this point. Uh, if you want to do that, read these articles by Kogut and uh, Savit. This is extensively discussed there. Okay. So l let me first do this limit. 
Here, I can just put this term to 0, OK, round about here. So then the ground state energy doesn't change at all. If I put these things to be minus 1s, who cares? Okay. So, so the ground state energy remains unchanged. If I put two electric charges, hold them there, and I'm in this limit of parameters, the ground state energy doesn't care. This remains unchanged. As I go away from this point, and I cannot show this, it would change somewhat, but it would change by a very little amount. Okay. Let's look at this point. Okay. Let me write. So, with this configuration of rho z. So I can write this Hamiltonian as follows. where the sum ranges only over this bonds, this type of bonds, OK? So added and subtracted things, OK? So now it's again a classical model, this being the I would have ferromagnetic order, but I would have to pay an energy cost here, okay, for as many variables uh, as there are, because across these uh, links, my spins, the mu spins, would be ferromagnetic, but because of this minus sign, I have to pay this extra energy cost. Again, you can choose a different gauge. You can put this minus link somewhere else, but this is roughly the minimum energy cost. It would only increase the energy cost by doing, making, making a longer string. Okay. So basically, this extra, en so the ground state energy of two e held, held at a distance r from each other is ground state energy of 0 e plus some number proportional to h. Huh? Sorry? Okay. Into r. Where R is the separation. Huh? Say that again. 
yeah, that's the lower bound you can just increase. If you take this strings, it's, it's the minimum distance. <laughs> so the point is that if you try to separate this, keep the, uh, put two electric charges far apart from each other, you would have to pay this energy cost in this here. So if you bring some of these terms down to create electric charges, and you are still in the vicinity of this phase, the electric charges would like to stay together. Okay. On the other hand, if you are here, if you put some of these electric charges uh, by hand and let them uh, let them uh, hop around, they would just hop around freely. On the other hand, here the electric charges, if you put them by hand and let them hop around by this kind of term, they cannot do that. It's a huge energy cost as they go away from each other. Okay. So, in a sense, that, uh, if I put electric charges here, they're deconfined here. If I put them and let them hop, they just go away from, to infinity from each other. On the other hand, if I put them here and let them hop, just want to clock together and uh, maybe annihilate in this case, because these are only icing charges. And, but in general, they would try to stay together and form a charge neutral object. Okay, so they are confined here. They are deconfined here. Okay, and this transition is going to get modified. Okay, and it would be a confinement deconfinement transition. So, so, so basically, this represent all the conventional uh, types of order where these electric charges are confined, and this is the deconfined phase, which is the uh, quantum spin liquid in this case, the Tori code ground state. Okay. So, so this is uh, uh, again a particular feature of quantum spin liquid, like long-range entangled ground states that uh, they uh, uh, allow this gauge theory description. And in this gauge, this gauge theory can be in two kinds of states, the, which one allows deconfinement, and the other uh, the, in which the charges are confined, the electric charges. You can play the same game with magnetic charges also, and uh, uh, find out the dual picture. But this is uh, what it means. Uh, to have a spin liquid, you have deconfined electric and magnetic charges. Okay, so this is again another feature of uh, spin liquid, which is uh, allowed only in presence of highly entangled uh, ground states, long-range entangled ground states. In particular, this is one kind. But uh, the point is that here we can track all the calculations without much trouble. But this is a much more general property than this particular model. Okay, any question? Okay. Suppose that you have some exactly solvable model like here, but yes. you have access to computers or then some Hamiltonian. Yes. What quantities would you look at? So the confinement, uh, confinement, deconfinement. Yeah, the natural quantities uh, to look at are what are known as Wilson loops. Okay, so the Wilson loops in this case would be like closed products of rho z, rho tilde z operators in the con deconfined phase. So, okay, let's.
tell first tell the answer and tell is uh, next tell what are the limitations. So, this in the deconfined phase this is basically taking this around a, a closed loop uh, and big closed loop and this in the deconfined phase goes as some number into the perimeter of that loop ok in the deconfined phase. And then in the uh, confined phase this would go in terms of the area of the loop the minimal area ok that is one statistic, but this is often uh, this is not a great statistic as Anders would tell you because if you have dynamic electric charges beyond a certain point you can always excite these dynamic electric charges and then everything looks serial or beyond a certain length scale. Yeah, cost a lot of energy, but you can bring them down. Uh, it's just for co convenience of our argument we have. Uh, yes, uh, it becomes more tricky to uh, calculate these kind of things. Uh, but. not necessarily there are complications if you have gapless electric charges and essentially fermionic then more complicated things arise because you might lose quasi particles, but still this state some way survives. Uh, maybe we should discuss this offline uh, yeah. any more question. Okay. So, at this point let me try to generalize a bit, uh, point out how similar low energy theories can arise in other models and uh, okay, let me think what to do. So, there are two things that I want to do from, uh, from here, one is basically discuss another effect which is a fractionalization of quantum numbers and two is discuss more realistic spin models and maybe show you uh, you one version of uh, the uh, same things which you might even though it is much more complicated you might recognize the answers easily uh, because it is Maxwell's electromagnetism. Uh, so, ok anyway let me start with uh, this realistic models and uh, then I can discuss, uh, I can start uh, the next lecture discussing uh, this fractionalization of charges. Okay. So, uh, the first is basically uh, quite straightforward, uh, John discussed some of these things uh, the Dimer models. So, okay. Okay, my notes are all over the place. Let me just. Okay, good. Yeah. So, so basically, I showed you things for uh, one very weird model, and it's uh, legitimate to ask uh, how general are these results. So, I'll try to motivate the answer to that in the rest of half an hour or so. So, so basically uh, the point is uh, that um, whether uh, can I get uh, similar low energy Z 2 gauge theories uh, for other models and I will start with uh, 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 the dimer models on uh, bipartite lattices as John have introduced them uh, the classical ones. Uh, did you discuss the quantum uh, dimer model and the uh, Z 2 gauge theory sorry I was not there. Uh, yes. 
Okay, so let me just start with that and then move to spin models. Okay, so so basically we know that if we have say Heisenberg models now the spin models on uh, some lattice uh, like a square lattice, it goes into a nail state. Okay, the ground state is nail ordered, and we had some discussion on the, this. So if I change the lattice to a, so these are all spin halves. Okay, so th this is not the state that we get. We get a spiral state. So these spins are 120 degree ordered and in a plane, uh, coplanar in the spin space. Okay, so suppose instead of doing these lattices, I just take two sides. Okay. So what is the answer? Suppose I. So the ground state is basically. Hmm, with the positive sign. Uh, singlet or what we would call the dimer. Okay. Turns out that. If you took. Uh, these two states and try to tile them to form these lattices. At some point, it's in the thermodynamic limit. It's more feasible to have these magnetically ordered states, and uh, what happens? But uh, this is what happens at two site level. Now, if I add terms here, various terms which I don't know, which I don't uh, know how to write, maybe. Uh, but something like uh, the j q terms uh, the, the q terms b uh, that Anders introduced, but not breaking the uh, various symmetries uh, okay mm, yeah. then it might happen that even in the uh, 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 thermodynamic limit on a large lattice, say I choose the triangular lattice for some reason I do not want to explain uh, right now, uh, that this magnetic type of phases are not suitable, uh, they do not sufficiently minimize the energy okay? uh, because of competing interactions, frustrations etcetera brought about by these uh, other terms, uh, the magnetic order is no longer energetically feasible. Any global order uh, uh, is not feasible. And then uh, what these spins try to do is to minimize the energy locally. And one great way of minimizing the energy locally is to form local these dimers with nearest neighbors. Okay? So that's the loose uh, mm. Uh, uh, lose motivation to study uh, the dimer models and uh, basically the point here is that the spins no, just like the electrons do not remain the, the degree of freedom uh, below this uh, uh, charge gap scale in a Hubbard type of uh, picture. Here uh, below this J scale there is dynamics but the spins themselves do not survive as good degree of freedom but these dimers are. Okay? The question is when can we access this physics? That is a slightly different question that depends upon what kind of terms I can write to add to this Hamiltonian. Okay? So, so, we will take uh, uh, this point of view that uh, some terms that we can write to the Hamiltonian uh, which would uh, stabilize this physics and the spins just disappear from the problem and what remains are the dimers and I have to write down uh, dynamics in terms of the dimers. Okay? So, so let me take this triangular lattice.
Okay. So in, in, uh, in this case, it also assume that these dimers only form nearest neighbors. So again, I have different ways of uh, covering this lattice. At every site, I have one dimer that is the only constraint that the spin uh, can form a dimer only with one uh, other spin. And so, I have this various ways to tell this. I do not know. Yeah, so, this something here. Yeah, so, I go on forever. This. There are many ways to do this. Again, the point is that if this was a classical problem, all these would lead to uh, macroscopic ground state entropy, which is not allowed in a quantum system. So, the system has to do something. So, uh, the leftover perturbations, uh, the dynamics of these dimers uh, would uh, have to be such that it gets rid of this zero temperature entropy. Okay, and it can do it in two ways, as we have learned. One is to undergo order by disorder. Quantum. So here, the quantum fluctuation uh, picks up one of the states uh, or a handful of the states and breaks symmetry. Okay, and the other is through. Uh, quantum superposition. Or this is sometimes also called disorder by disorder. So, basically the point is that I have all the classical uh, ground states say one different timer coverings and the quantum uh, ground state is some superposition of this classical ground states, okay, some suitable superposition which minimizes the energy of a handful of those states. This is macroscopic often, so it contains a large number, uh, contains a huge amount of entropy, but suppose I can find three or four uh, states like this which have a lower energy. That is how I quench the entropy. And, but I, uh, because of huge superposition, it cannot have these local motifs. There is no product state description in terms of dimers. So, there is uh, uh, a lot of entanglement and uh, I can get uh, a state which is, uh, uh, which does not break any symmetry of the uh, system, but at the same time uh, does not have the uh, classical entropy. Okay, so so this is the second. Uh, this second route is what we would discuss, and this is interesting for quantum spin liquids. Okay, and this is uh, this often leads to this picture called resonating valence bonds (RVB). Okay, and this particular problem of resonating uh, quantum dimers on. Uh, 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 triangular lattice among several people, I think Moisner, something did PRL to one, I think. That is a good reference to start with. There are, must be other references. Okay. So, let us try to understand this picture more carefully. Okay. So, let us draw two states, as I think you have already seen. So, locally everything else is same and think about another state where okay, we can draw many such states and 
uh, lowest order dynamics which is consistent with various symmetries and here I am basically not telling you many things some of which I do not know. Uh, the lowest order dynamics in terms of dimers connecting different ground states classical ground states might be a tunneling element between this state and this state everything else is fixed. Okay? So, if I draw the states this means that everything else is fixed and I do this I want to go to this state okay? and the term allowing me to do this is this. and it is Hermitian conjugate. Okay. So, I, if I hit it with this state it goes to this state and the Hermitian conjugate does the opposite thing. This is a minimal dynamics I put it in here in the model. Okay. There can be other uh, potential terms which I will return to in a moment, but this is what it is. Okay. So, this is typically the Hamiltonian let me now cast it try to cast it in the form of the Z to gaze theory. Okay. So, but there is one condition uh, here that at each side there is only one dimer cannot have configurations like this. Okay. So, the physical state does not allow these configurations. Good. So, here I need to. So, now on every bond I introduce a variable n i j which is 0 if no dimer plus 1 a dimer. So, if I look at the 6 uh, the bonds only one bond can have plus 1 and the rest have to be 0 ok that is a constraint ok. Good. So, it is useful to instead of working with zeros and 1s let us cast it in the form of 1 and minus 1. So, I introduce this operator and accordingly sigma plus 1 is a dimer and sigma minus 1 is no dimer sigma x. Okay. And the fact that uh, you need to have uh, one dimer per site is basically if you choose find out any state in terms of the sigma x s and you operate it with this operator product over i 2 1 plus summation over j n i j where j is the nearest neighbor this should give, give me that is valid for any physical state. Okay. So, I can try to implement this in this hard form oh, okay. so I need to write this. So, then this type of configuration is basically if I draw this. So, this is like 1 0 plus 1 0 and this is plus 1 0 0 plus 1 okay yeah. sorry i think i made an error writing this let me come back to this in a moment i want to discuss this okay so okay i think i need to write, i need to write exponential of that quantity 
Okay, so so basically the point is that I want to go uh, to go from here to here. I uh, would have to change variables. The sigma x is uh, from plus one to minus one. So these I have written n's. These are sigma variables. Okay. So I have to change the value of sigma x's, and the way that I do it. I know how to change the value of sigma x s just operating by sigma z. Okay. So, an operator uh, which would do this job is basically product of sigma z on these four bonds. I could have chosen this. So, I could have chosen this square, I could have chosen different squares. Okay. So, but this is the operator which performs this job. This is very similar to this, maybe I should write rho, but this is very uh, this is exactly this operator sigma z i j i j belonging to. Sorry for the change of notation. Same as row tildes and rows that I was using. Okay. Yeah, I think I wrote this wrong. Should be exponential of this quantity. Pi. Which basically gives a plus sign for even, yeah, for odd number of timers. That's right, maybe minus. So, I can impose uh, this condition of having one dimer per site uh, either through uh, projection like that, that might actually be wrong. Let me think about it a moment. Uh, but I can introduce it energetically. I make try to make configurations that are energetically more expensive to have more dimers. Okay? Then I can really treat all. Uh, so, uh, Basically, I can uh, treat all these operators sigma x's freely. I allow this kind of configurations uh, sigma x to be plus 1, plus 1, but I can just make this configuration much more energetically expensive than this configuration, and uh, then there are minus 1's everywhere. So, I can impose a constraint through hard. Uh, the projector, I try to impose this as a soft energetic constraint and uh, try to understand whether these are, this gives rise to same universal properties. Okay? So, basically you would try to do this for, yeah. one way to do this is is to add an energy penalty like this and take the u to be very large and positive okay and uh, it's energetically a way to yeah Say that again. Oh, so this J sum is over the nearest neighbors. So what confuses me is that yeah. you have drawn that triangle there, and you were talking about energetic energetics of that triangle. 
But this is not enough to satisfy your constraint that you have no two diamonds touching on a, on a side. Uh, yeah, I just drew, uh, I uh, would basically So any site having this? Right, so this you would not allow? Yeah, I would energetically okay, penalize. So, so, so when you talk about your constraint, it is that you, you make the sum of uh, all, it, all n's around all the J's, site. Yeah, all j's run uh, over the nearest okay, number of Okay, OK, excellent. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry, uh, I'm doing this badly. All j connected to Yeah, all j connected to i. All j connected to i yes neighbors so okay so this is i this j runs over all these sides okay this has if this is not one i penalize it okay and now if you use this you would get other terms and but you would also get this uh, sigma x term over the bounds. Okay? So this uh, Miltonian uh, has this term plus if you expand this you would get this minus sigma x term uh, plus other terms sigma x, sigma x and uh, others. So again you can analyze it in the general uh, uh, parameter regime and uh, there is a, a parameter regime over which it gives rise to the same physics as this deconfined Isengage theory. Okay? Yeah. Any, any even power, right? So, uh, yeah, so the power 2 uh, is the lowest and universally the most. I mean, if you do an RG, uh, if you think about uh, doing an RG, I don't know how to do it. It is the uh, uh, most relevant term that you can uh, add. Okay? Maybe a four term also is. Okay. Okay? So, so, basically, the point is that you can start with such dimer models. Uh, start, uh, uh, basically, the underlying thing is a spin model, and uh, the low, uh, low energy physics is described by dimers, and it gives rise to this. Uh, this uh, uh, Isengage theory, but notice that here there is only this magnetic flux term and only the electric field term sigma x coming from this expansion of this term. There is no electric charge. Okay. Again, that's because the electric charges are uh, basically when I split, uh, when I uh, excite this dimer, break it up into two spins. Those are now the electric charges. Okay? Again, it's a high energy term, just like we arrived at similar models in context of Torico throwing away the electric charges. I've thrown away the electric charges by uh, the, taking the two spins and putting them in a, uh, a singlet state. I can pay an energy cost of the order of J and split this uh, dimer, okay? excite this into a triplet. And then you can show that these are now my electric charges. Okay. So, so, so in the deconfined phase, uh, these electric charges would be uh, uh, in the spin liquid phase. These electric charges would be deconfined in the sense that when I create them, it uh, takes a lot of energy to create them. But once I create them, uh, these can move apart from each other if I give them a kinetic energy, a hopping term. But if it is in the confined state, in terms of this U's and uh, these T's, okay, then it's much uh, uh, energetically uh, feasible to not uh, have uh, these go ab away from each other. It costs energy linearly with their distance and have them together uh, into this uh, into this. Uh, 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 neutral object, which is a dimer. Okay. So, 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 but the most important thing, the uh, uh, difference from this last problem, is that in this kind of problem, 
the Hamiltonian that I wrote down, the term that I wrote down uh, had a spin rotation symmetry, okay, S dot S. And if I keep also the perturbation spin rotation invariant, then spin is a good quantum number for the system. So, these uh, spins that I create uh, by breaking a dimer also have to have good quantum numbers under the spin rotation invariance. Okay? So, so, in addition to the electric charge, they must carry a global quantum number. Okay? In, in this case, the spin, uh, spin quantum number. Okay? They transform non trivially under spin, they are spin halves. Okay, so so when they carry such global quantum numbers, uh, as I'll show in the next class, that uh, in presence of these reconfinement, these global quantum numbers can be fractionalized. Okay, I'll tell you the meaning of what uh, fractionalization is. But the point that I wanted to drive here is that uh, here, in addition to the Tori code, the low energy theory is uh, the same. But the additional feature is that it has this internal symmetry, the spin rotation symmetry. And uh, you can immediately see uh, something uh, interesting. If I break this and I allow this to propagate. So, I had a spin 0 object, I create a spin 1 object. I will be done in 2 minutes. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, I created a spin 1 object and that is like these 2. So, but there is no real difference between this and this. Okay? So, the spin 1 has to be equally divided uh, amongst the 2. Okay? So, so, each of them actually carries spin half and if I let them propagate uh, from each other, each of the and locally detect, uh, try to detect what is the magnetization, it would be this spin half. This is very different from the spin wave uh, uh, operator that uh, we started out with uh, in the first lecture, where I create a single spin flip at single site and allow it to propagate. Okay? So, that is a single spin flip which is a spin 1 object and it is propagating uh, all by itself. On the other hand, I create this spin 1 object sing, uh, singlet to triplet it breaks up and uh, can uh, go around as two spin halves. Okay? So, this is one fractionalization of the spin 1, which is a good quantum number of the system into two spin halves. I will try to make this more precise uh, in the last lecture, uh, uh, not in terms of these uh, spin operators, which are internal symmetries and non abelian groups, but in terms of translation operators things that I can work out in real time. Okay? So, that would be the end. Okay, thanks.